Everyone has a story. And so if someone's a supervisor out there, I would say job number one is to listen and know your team, listen to their stories. Every individual in the military is serving and comes from all these unique, amazing backgrounds, and they've conquered their own challenges. The mission has to get done and you want it to be done well. And so listen, learn, and know your team. Welcome to Long Blue Leadership, presented by the U.S. Air Force Academy Association and Foundation. Your host for this edition of Long Blue Leadership is Navir Walkowitz, USAFA class of 99, currently serving the Association of Graduates as Senior Vice President of Alumni Relations and Business Development, and as a member of the AOG Board of Directors. And now, Navir Walkowitz. My guest today is retired Major General Heather Pringle, a 1991 graduate of the Air Force Academy. General Pringle's journey from in-processing day to her current role in the nonprofit sector spans 32 years. Along the way, she served in education, warfighter support, research, innovation, and global leadership roles culminating in the command of Air Force Research Laboratory, Air Force Materiel Command. There is a unique first from her days as a four degree that stands out, and it makes me wonder how that affected the trajectory of her Air Force career. We'll talk about that with the general and much more. General Pringle, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me, Navir, and please call me Heather. So Heather, let's go back a little bit, you know, some early days, back to the beginning. Let's talk about what you were like as a kid, where you grew up, talk about your family. Well, I grew up in a small town in Idaho, and I guess before we really dig in, I do want to say thanks so much for having me here. It's it's an honor to be able to talk to your audience and share some stories, and if there's any way I can be of help, that's, that's what I'm all about. So growing up in Idaho, uh, it's well known for the place where Evil Knievel jumped the Snake River Canyon, but he did not land on the other side or the part of the canyon where I grew up. The excitement surrounding it really uh, enthralled me. And uh, you asked what I was like growing up, and I love to challenge. I love to learn new things. And maybe that was a little difficult on my parents, but boy, they did a, such a great job of instilling values in me and always doing my best and working hard and trying to make a difference for others. Oh my goodness, that's wonderful. And so um, you grew up, you moved to Idaho siblings in the picture as well? I do. I'm the oldest of three, and uh, my sister served in the Air Force as a nurse, and my younger brother, also known as Zoom, uh, also served in the Air Force as well. He was a pilot, and um, yes, so he was a pilot. There you go. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And another long blue line graduate of the Air Force Academy. Absolutely. He was class of 1996. Is that something, did you know you wanted to go to the Academy? How did that come about? My aunt and uncle live on a ranch in Wyoming, and that's where I spent my summer. So that part about hard work and doing chores and, you know, dawn to dusk type stuff, uh, they taught me a lot about working to uh, make a contribution. And my aunt was a high school teacher. And as part of her curriculum, she went on a trip to Annapolis, and she came back. And she said if she had her life to do over again, she would go to a service academy. That was the first I'd ever heard of a service academy. I'm so grateful to my aunt and uncle. Um, and I did my own research and found out about the Air Force Academy in Colorado. And it had an exchange with France, okay. which was really fun. Uh, and that intrigued me as well. So I just worked hard and did my best, and I got lucky. So did you get to go on an exchange? I used to joke that it was my favorite semester at the academy, <laughs> but um, there were a lot of great semesters <laughs> at the academy, but France was a unique one. That and is so unique. My brother and I have a unique distinction that we're the only brother-sister, at least a couple years ago that was true, the only brother-sister uh, combo that went to the French exchange. But I'm, I'm sure today's cadets uh, have already surpassed that milestone and many more. 
the level of talent coming in and just how smart they are. I don't know that I would have made it in today's. Oh, for sure. With where I was, you know, back, you know, 95. I completely (laughs) agree. It's mind blowing. And I'm just so impressed by the cadet population and their talent and their selfless drive. It's amazing, and I'm very honored. They they make me look better than I am, and uh, they're they're just fantastic. And the future is really bright, and we're in great hands. What was cadet life like for you? So cadet life was oh I don't even know how to describe it, but um, I have a couple memories about that time. So the first one. Um, is I was on the plane and parents shipped me from Idaho to Colorado Springs. And I'm sitting next to somebody on the plane who has this little gold book in front of him. And I'm looking and I said, well, hi, uh, I'm Heather. And it turns out the individual was going to the academy and had this book. What's that? He said, well, we have to memorize quotes. And Uh, So that was the first part. And then the bus ride from the airport to, at the time, it was Bring Me Men Ramp. It was dreary. It was raining. It was a rare, rainy day here in Colorado. And so, you know, the ambiance started to sink in. And the weight of what I was about to enter started hitting me. And I started getting worried and Could I cut it? And was I good enough? And all I could do was try. And the other funny memory that I have, Navir, is uh, they take you around on indoctrination day and you uh, get measured for boots, you get measured for uniforms, et cetera, and they cut your hair. Yes, I remember that vividly. (laughs) Yes, and I had my hair cut before I went because I was going to be as prepared as I could. And immediately after getting my hair cut, Uh, They hand you the little placard to hold under your chin, and they were going to take your military identification photo. And I had the biggest grin because I was just proud and happy to be (laughs) a part of the Cadet Corps and just loving life. And then immediately after that, uh, an upperclassman came around and definitely trained the smile right out of me. (laughs) I was the last one for a little bit. Oh, my goodness. So that was definitely a memory for sure. Um, Let's talk a little bit more about while you're at the academy. Um, I know you going before the academy, you dabbled in different things and challenges. What were some of the experiences that you got involved with or maybe clubs or groups that you got involved with while, while you're at the academy? Oh, that was that was so fun. And the clubs really helped uh, build that feeling of connection and camaraderie and family. In addition to your squadron, um, I was in the Protestant choir. um, So I really enjoyed that. I was a hurdler. Oh, wow. I'm not great. I'm really, really not great. I was definitely (laughs) the walk on. But it, there's something for everyone, and that's that's the goodness of it. And it it just was really great. And I'm still friends with some of my track colleagues, and um, really lucky to make some great friends during that time. Uh, I thought I'd mention as well. It wasn't all roses, as you can imagine. And I entered uh, in high school. I really liked physics, and I thought, you know maybe I'll do physics. And I was kind of worried about that Idaho. Would the Idaho education be up to standards for what they would need at the academy? And I took physics my freshman year. I did not do well on the uh, test that I had. So I pretty quickly uh, dropped physics as a major. And that's a tiny little regret uh, that I have. Um, What did you end up majoring in then? Human factors, which is no regret whatsoever. I loved it. Yes. And I loved the opportunity to combine technology and the human side of yeah. it. And it's it really worked out very, very well. At the time, though, I was a little disappointed that I didn't quite cut it. But um, that's one of the thoughts that I had might be of interest is don't give up on your dreams um, when you're going through the academy. And I'll say that even when one door closes, a window opens. And you're right. Human factors was the best thing ever. I loved it. I pursued it as a scientist and uh, met many great people. And I leave the physics to the really, really 
uh, talented people, which is there are so many out there. Well, that really speaks volumes because so many listeners, I think, are at you know, different points when you come to a crossroad and, and you kind of wonder, which way do I go? So I think that's a really great story that you shared there because sometimes the path that you're not even seeing is the one that you should be going on. And that's kind of how you, you approached it. So at the Academy, were there any particular leaders that really spoke to you and, and shaped you in a way that you knew was going to kind of make a difference in your career after the Academy? You look to so many around you uh, I, I leaned on so many people from my roommates um, along the way to uh, faculty. I was really drawn to um, uh, the academic side, and I had a lot of faculty that I looked up to, and they encouraged me. Uh, my academic advisor, for example, um, made a friendly bet with me once that uh, I should get a particular grade point average. And you know me, I love a challenge. <laughs> so I didn't just meet the you challenge, crushed but it, I crushed you? it. Yes. And, you know, and then my AOCs, I still have my cadet coin mm -hmm. from Fifth Squadron. Oh, my from goodness. From my AOC from 1991. It, it's phenomenal. And I just can't believe how many people are dedicated to helping cadets succeed across the wing across the base. I mean, we can't forget all those folks that are keeping the dorms That's warm. Right. That's right. And ensuring that, uh, you know, all the grounds are kept up to speed. And um, I, if I could say thank you to all of them for the lack of thank yous that I said at the time, I would love to do so now. You know, your class was amongst the first cadets to receive desktop computers. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, I can think of a lot of firsts that cadets have, but this was a game changer for the academy. What did that look like for you and, and did it, you know, shape anything for what you wanted to do in the future? My class was actually the second to receive the okay. desktop computers. Okay. So the freshmen had computers and the sophomores but not the juniors and not the How seniors. Interesting. Very fascinating tool differential. So uh, I do remember getting the computer during basic training and trying to figure out how to stick the floppy in <laughs> to boot up the computer and, and use it. And we also had an intranet at the time. And I would say that our class got very, very good at coordinating spirit missions using our computers. That's awesome. And the juniors and seniors were none the wiser. And so we, uh, I, I would say, you know, we had to be pretty good about doing that. Right. But um, we could never pull the wool over the, um, over the eyes of our sophomores. And they were always right there uh, to get us. But... Um, I even remember a couple upperclassmen requesting services, for example, in terms of uh, entering papers into the computer so that they would have a document because I had it and uh, they didn't rather than handwriting or typing. Just share, do you have a, a particular uh, spirit mission that st stands out into your mind that you remember? Oh, I don't even know if I should get into those. <laughs> Uh, fair enough, fair enough. Let's just say, you know, I really bonded with my classmates yeah. and I'm really grateful for having those friends over the years as well. So, yeah, there we I I'm sure we weren't the best uh or the worst, but yeah, we made our mark, I guess. That makes sense. I think all of our, all of every class I think feels like they either had it the toughest or they had the best spirit mission, so, you know. Yeah, we're probably time. right in the middle. <laughs> right in the middle. Well, maybe we can shift a little bit um, to your career, but before we do, for those listeners that are thinking about the Air Force Academy or kind of, you know, lessons that you learn, if you can go back and, and talk to Cadet Heather, ah. um, you know, what would you say to her? Oh, I would say just keep going for it and enjoy it because it's over too quickly. And uh, and I, I think I did... I didn't really realize how many people were there to help me. And I don't think I asked for help enough uh, when I needed it. So um, I would say that there are people that want you to succeed yes. and they're there to help cadets succeed. So that would be my message. That is great advice. So let's let's talk about this 32 years of amazing leadership um, 
in the in the Air Force, and I know that you're very modest. Well, um, it spans two centuries, <laughs> so I I think um, <laughs> it's not all that remarkable. And I have to say, you know, even given that the long blue line, there are so many leaders to look up to, like Heather Wilson, David Goldfein, yes. Mark Welsh, who excitingly is going to be the president of Texas A and M. So proud of him. And so many great leaders to look up to. You know, it's very humbling just to be a part of it and to help someone else make it better uh, and follow in their great footsteps. Yes. Well, I think that's part of what makes us so special is because I think every, you know, uh, person that shares their experiences when it comes to their their like leadership lessons or just some of the, the trials, tribulations, successes, someone that's listening on the other end can pick something from that and say like, oh, that really, that really spoke to me. So, um, you know, we'll talk about your career. Maybe you can just share just off the bat, you know, you're a mom. I am. You're a wife. You were also, you know, you did 32 years in leadership positions. What's that like juggling all of that? How did you do that? I don't know that I did it very well. Uh, you, you know, you just do the best you can. Um, but First is having a great husband who supported me along the way and made sure that the kids were fed. And yeah, I'll say they had dirt on their faces or, you know, my daughter dressed in mismatched, you know, whatever. But it was just a it was just a great life. And uh, I'm really grateful that he was helping me through the ups and the downs. It's hard to be a mom and to be active duty, and it gets harder over time. It's especially hard when they're little, juggling, and you kind of feel like, wow, I'm failing at being a mom. I'm failing at being an officer, and how do you manage both? And I would just say, give yourself a break and be the best you that you can be. Um, I once tried to be something or meet a standard that I thought was the right thing to do. But uh, once I decided, you know what, I'm Heather, I'm from Idaho, and not many of us are, and I'm a mom, and I just kind of owned that as part of my leadership. Uh, I was happier, and um, I don't know if I did better, but um, I was able to to go further because of it. And I was much more comfortable in my skin. And, you know, you take the highs and the lows and you just keep going. No, that's wonderful. I think I think that, you know, uh, there's young officers that feel that pressure, both moms and dads. And and so I think that it's it's nice to hear those who have done so well to, to admit, you know, hey, it's, it's tough at times. And sometimes you got to lean on your network and your network can be a lot of different things. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Well, and you, you might end up going to work once in a while with spit up on your shoulder or, uh, you know, kind of being a little, you know, or, or late to a soccer game. And uh, you don't have to I guess that's what I'm really saying is you don't have to be perfect across the board. Just be you. That's wonderful. What would you share as maybe, I think that's a great um, nugget for those that are listening that maybe are feeling some of those pressures. What advice might you give to supervisors that um, maybe have some um, some members in there um, on their teams that you, know, that you might say, maybe consider giving grace or what, what does that look like to you that you might share? This is something that I learned from General Mark Welsh and he said, Everyone has a story. And so if someone's a supervisor out there, I would say job number one is to listen and know your team. Listen to their stories. And every individual in the military is serving and comes from all these unique, amazing backgrounds. And they've conquered their own challenges, whether it's past or present. And so when supervisors understand that, then they can better meet the individual in the middle. Of course, the mission has to get done and you want it to be done well. National security is an imperative and we're depending on our uniform members. So I'm, I'm not worried about our military letting us down. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're living up to what our military needs and so listen, learn, and 
see if we can meet in the middle. I mean, it goes back to taking care of your people. And then I think that you just, you said, you couldn't have said that any better. Maybe you can share um, some of the, the challenges that you might have experienced. Um, you talked about, you know, being a mom and being a leader. Talk about just in leadership in general, what was maybe the, one of the most challenging things you've experienced and how did you overcome that? It had a variety of challenges throughout my career. I'll, I'll say I didn't have necessarily a straight line <laughs> in the way that I went. And I think that's great. Can you tell me more? What do you mean by that? It wasn't like so much a linear right. progression. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know if I was, you know, I applied to a lot of different opportunities. You know, there's so many. And I, you know, I didn't get half of them or more. Um, wanted to be a squadron commander down at Air Education and Training Command down at Lackland. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get selected. That's okay. Mm -hmm. It like it's I kept going and doing other things and other doors opened. And so you just uh, you just don't give up. That would have been an amazing opportunity. And uh, what they do down at Lackland is phenomenal. But, you know, that's just one example of, uh, you know, something I tried and didn't pan out. But what do you do? You just keep going and try something new or work on those skills and learn from it. The worst thing I could have done or the worst thing anyone could do is to let that, you know, non-selection define them as an individual or feel like, you know, um, all hope for the future is lost. That's not, couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, all learning comes from failure and that's something we need to embrace exactly. to improve, to adapt to change and to keep getting better. Right. And to grow as leaders. To grow as leaders. So I love a challenge. So I took those failures as a challenge. Mm -hmm. All right. What am I going to learn? What am I going to do next? And it probably even helped in your, you probably mentor others and, you know, that are going through similar challenges that actually, like, let's look at this from a different vantage point. And because you kind of went through those different um, experiences, you're able to be even more impactful in their lives. It is important to be honest and give feedback that helps individuals grow. And so um, another thought maybe for supervisors is we don't do them any favors if we don't tell them honestly where they're strong, but where they need to work. And so we all want to improve and we all want to be the best that we can at whatever job that we've been given. So I welcome that kind of feedback and I'm currently learning about what I need to do. And so I've got a lot to learn. So I'm all ears every day, all day long. I think there's a, and I don't know that it's not a direct quote, it's not certainly not in contrails, but there's something that talks about, I think, truly being kind is being honest, you know, being truthful with people. And I think that's some, some of the best ways we can be kind is by just being honest and truthful with others. So sure. No, that's wonderful. So you had mentioned that some of the best things that, you know, advice you can give to someone is ways that they can improve. Was there any particular mentor or leader that just gave you something that really stuck with you aside from general wealth that maybe you've taken with you in your career as a growth opportunity? A lot. I, I, I honestly, I really have so many people that I'm grateful for uh, leaving a mark on me. Um, you know, I, I learned or watched from afar um, General Lori Robinson, and she would always say, be the best airman you can be, but also be the best wingman that you can be. And I think that is another area where uh, not only trying to improve yourself, but uplift your teammates. And the mission gets done a hundred times better if the whole team is working in concert. It the success or the failure of the mission isn't on one person's shoulders. It never is on one person's shoulders, just like being a cadet. Exactly. Isn't just on the cadet's shoulders. There's a whole team of folks out there who, if we are the best wingmen that we can be, uh, then the mission will succeed. Right. Now, teams are where it's at. And you had the opportunity to lead an incredible team at AFRL. Um, and what's so I think so cool about that is you were at a time when you were supporting both Air and Space Force. Let's talk a little bit about that. Talk, talk about what was it like when you found out you're going to be commanding, you know, Air Force Research Laboratory? How did that feel? And, and oh. maybe just kind of share some of those 
uh, moments with us? Well, the Air Force Research Lab, which, you know, don't get confused about Air Force in the name because it's there for the Space Force, too, and uh, provides a ton of amazing technologies for Guardians. Um, that was the honor of a lifetime, a huge privilege because that team is eye-wateringly smart and brilliant and innovative. And they are every day focused on solving problems for warfighters. What could be a higher calling than that? I, I just enjoyed getting to know them. Uh, helping them succeed, and they're doing some amazing things for, you know, they shoot lasers, they build robots, they blow things up, they code like crazy. It's just... And they love it. They love it, and they're great at it. They're yes. the best in the world, and um, I'm forever grateful to have had that opportunity, and I know they continue that mission even today. That's the other beauty of the military. So even when you have an opportunity, you're always moving, right? And now I know that the research lab is in wonderful, amazing, great hands of a test pilot and doing even better things. And so it keeps getting better and better. Right. Just like those cadets <laughs> who are better than, uh, we, than we, we were, were. Yes. back in the day. Mm -hmm. Air is better today than it ever was. And it's going in the right direction. And I would encourage anybody who's listening is to go look up the research lab because it's pretty inspiring and uh, uh, they don't get the credit they deserve. That's for sure. Well, that is good for people. I think people always want to know, like, how do we get to some of these te technologies that are doing all of these things and supporting our guardians, our Air Force, our, our you know, what does that look like? And I think that's cool that you said, hey, go check it out. And part of that is maybe that journey will take them there as well. Yeah. So that'd be great wonderful opportunity like you said you know chance of a lifetime how did you find out when you were selected for that oh i i don't even remember <laughs> <laughs> uh it was probably a blur i just um pretty incredulous though i i i'll say this when i graduated in 1991 so last century i never would have dreamed that i would have had such an opportunity or such a wonderful opportunity to be a part of a team like that. So as I said, my trajectory or my path may have been weaving and I got so lucky to be there and now they're doing great things. I I just remember trying to relish every moment and trying to relate to the team that uh, what they did mattered and they're in it for the long haul. So when they're solving problems, it's not a today problem. It's a problem for 10 years from now. So it can be a little discouraging, but that's where you kind of have to have that. You're in it for the long game. So I don't really remember. It was kind of a blur. I just- The whole experience was in itself just amazing. Yeah, and it was also COVID. So that was a bit of a tricky wicket to navigate and figure out, well, how are you going to lead a distributed, uh, diverse organization like that. Um, yeah, it was cool. Was there a particular capability that um, like under your leadership and with the team with you that um, you're, you could you know just share about that you're proud that kind of was accomplished during your tenure? Well, they, they did it all. So um, all the credit goes to the 10,000 uh, professionals who do all that problem solving. Um, they were focused on everything from, oh, the battle network, uh, JADC2, to all the space technologies, which are so exciting, and um, also the collaborative combat aircraft was a big one. And the other thing, I'll mention it here too, uh, even in that organization, it was important to think about who else is contributing to that mission. So all of those technologies were collaborative efforts with acquirers in Air Force Materiel Command and the program offices, with the warfighters who were helping us understand what is needed on the battlefield and everyone in between. So none of that work gets done without the whole team contributing. 
was there any moments that you uh, remember that you were surprised? Were there any particular people that just really kind of stood out to you that you were just so incredibly um, happy that you were able to be a part of their team while you're there? I used to say that if I um, if I'm not surprised every single day, then the Air Force Research Lab isn't doing its job. Love that. <laughs> so. Over the course of a couple years, there were plenty of surprises uh, and lots of opportunities to learn. I say that in quotes. So you were asking before the show, what are unicorns? Yes. And I, I may have overused the phrase, but I always thought of the team at the research lab as unicorns because each one was unique. We had opera singers and fiction writers and band players and by the way, the world record for pumpkin chucking in a trebuchet is held by an AFRL team. Wow. So, okay. <laughs> super exciting. Another thing to go look up. But, yes. But everyone had a unique story. They came from such amazing backgrounds. And here they were dedicated to serving the nation through technology. Wow, it was exciting. Well, let's talk a little bit about your transition from the military um, side to the civilian sector and nonprofit work. What has that been like for you? Well, it was uh, it was hard to say goodbye uh, to the team, and um, you know, like all things, you know, uh, life goes on, and they're doing amazing, which is I'm so proud of them and so happy for them, and uh, that's what you love to see, and that's truly the beauty of the military. And coming to being a retired person, I love being called Heather. So that's probably, and mom, actually. I love mom first. Uh, and I get that a lot more than, um, you know, when I was full-time military. And I have found that a lot of the things that you learn, the, those gifts that you pick up through your military career are valued by the civilian sector. So having a mission focus, thinking about, you know, what is it you're trying to accomplish and then focusing all your efforts on that. And you can't forget, it all starts with the team and who they are and the leadership that permeates everything. So no mission gets accomplished without the team they're behind it. So uh, I've spent time getting to know this new team that I'm a part of, uh, learning their unique contributions and understanding what the mission is. And then again, relying on that whole external teamwork, uh, that external group of partners and stakeholders who also want success for that mission. And you find it's not lonely. You're not alone in accomplishing that, that so many people want you to succeed. And um, that's that's what I want for your listeners. I want them to go conquer the world, make it better, you know, sweep up all that broken glass that uh, me and my trouble classmates made. And it's a little change, you know, you all say I have more to give. And so that spirit of service before self, wow, is that, if that isn't in my blood, I'm I am really hoping to continue to serve my family, my community, and my team. And so I've got more to give. And the Academy gave me those foundational skills to give more. I mean, well, so starting with your family to your time as a cadet, your time in the military, and now the civilian, this new journey, what are some of the most important lessons that you've learned? Maybe in leadership, but maybe just in, um, you know, being a successful um, servant? Uh, well, you know, and it's not always success. It's yeah. it's going through setbacks, learning more and trying to be more honest. And, um, and, and sometimes those learnings are hard too. Right. And I had to, I had, there were times when I had to think long and hard about okay, what does this really mean? Am I being truly honest with myself? <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm far from perfect. Uh, but, you know, I guess just, you know, being the best person that you are, own who, whatever unique story that you are. Don't try and be something you're not. 
um, you know, I'm from Idaho, you're from Nebraska, <laughs> we can do this. That's right, right? that's right. And yes. it makes makes the solution so much better. And the more we help each other, the more successful our world will be. I guess the one thing I haven't mentioned really is uh, take time to be with your family and know that they're making your service possible. And uh, now I'm giving back to them. I mean, you've given so many incredible nuggets about yourself, and I think that people can really relate to that are listening. Um, what's something that you really want them to remember about you? That I, connection? I would just say, don't think about me, you know, just go for it. And if you need help, call me. You know? <laughs> so that's it. I love just, that. I just say go for it. There's nothing should be stopping you. And, you know, every challenge is an opportunity to learn, and I bet you are so much better than you even know that you are. Um, so go for it. I think that was a great boiled down nugget there. There you go. <laughs> well, I do want to just make sure, was there anything that I didn't ask you that you would really love for our listeners to, to hear? Uh, no, I just want to say thanks for having me. I hope it's been an enjoy. It's I've enjoyed the conversation. I have as well, so very much, yes. But, um, you know, it's... It's important to be part of this community and give back. And thanks for doing these kinds of podcasts to spread the word and get people excited about coming to the Academy and serving our Air Force and our Space Force. There is so much out there to do and we need great people. And uh, there's a lot of us out there rooting for you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Shabir. <laughs> you have a wonderful day. You as well. You've been listening to Long Blue Leadership, a production of the Long Blue Line Podcast Network, presented by the U.S. Air Force Academy Association and Foundation. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests do not reflect those of the United States Air Force, Air Force Academy, Association of Graduates and Foundation, its staff or management. The Long Blue Leadership Podcast drops every two weeks on Tuesday mornings, Subscribe to Long Blue Leadership on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Plus Alexa, and all your favorite podcast platforms. Search at Air Force Grads on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and more for show announcements and updates. And visit longblueleadership.org for past episodes and more Long Blue Line Podcast Network programming.